you get to a point in any business where you have to make a decision. Am I going full in or am I ditching it? And it becomes quite difficult to make that decision because you've already sunk your time, your energy, your money into this project. You've sunk a lot into it. Am I ready to abandon what I've built? And making those decisions can be particularly tough. Join us today as we find out whether Keith is going to take the year-long lease on the trailer or whether he's going to stop and start again. The extraordinary belongs to those that create it. Rebelling against business plans and debt, rebelling against what society expects of us to build cool businesses, make money, have fun and do good. Let's create something extraordinary together. Welcome to The Rebel Entrepreneur. Welcome back to The Rebel Entrepreneur podcast. I've got back with me Keith from Redheaded Step Tacos. Keith, welcome back to the show. Thank you so much. Happy to be here, Alan. Uh, We were meant to be speaking yesterday, but you didn't show. What happened, Keith? What happened? Yes, I feel terrible. Usually I'm a man of my word. I like being where I say I'm going to be. But uh, yes, after a very grueling Saturday selling out of the food trailer, the heat combined with not getting enough food and water into my system, I guess, and who knows what else was going on. But basically, something hit me, took me out completely. Barely made it home on the drive late at night after cleaning up and uh, pretty much collapsed on the uh, living room floor. My wife had to change me into my pajamas and prod me up to bed and uh, just felt terrible, nauseous, you know, lightheaded and didn't look at my phone until I woke up at eight o'clock the next morning and saw the messages from you saying, hey, everything okay? So, uh, yep, luckily... Alan was nice enough to reschedule for today, but moral of the story (laughs) is don't overdo it. Don't overwork yourself. Take care of yourself first uh, before you take care of your business. It's easy for me to get distracted when I'm out uh, working and, you know, the time passes and I'm busy. I don't think to eat or, you know, sometimes drink. So definitely remember to take care of yourself before anything. Yes. And I knew it was unlike you not to show up for the podcast. Uh, My first reaction is, are you okay? Let me know you're okay. What's going on? (laughs) Um, That's generally my first reaction. And it sounds like it was needed this time because you exhausted yourself working through the day in the truck. I think that's what it was. I worried my mom and my wife pretty bad, you know, how they get. So they're uh, messaging me. Oh, do we we need to take you to the urgent care? Is everything okay? What can we do to help you out? So, yep, I had a lot of people in my corner. But, yep, I feel like a new man today. So it's all good. It's all good. It's all good. So seriously, what have you learned? Because, well, that's the second question, which we know the answer to is, were you going to trade or not? Because we had one weekend left before the end of that period where you've got the truck and you have to commit whether you're going all in or not. And this was the last weekend to do the last experiment. And we left the last episode going, Keith's tired. He doesn't know whether he's going to do it or not. (laughs) You were definitely looking a little bit more like, uh, I'm not sure whether I want to do this. But it sounds like you did it. Run us through from the start. What made you make the decision to just go for it? Well, even last week in the back of my head, I, I kind of knew it was, uh, you know, from the business standpoint, just made sense because it was my last weekend before I had to make the decision uh, like we discussed. So I was basically just giving myself a few days to see how I felt. I started feeling a lot better about the middle of the week, and uh, my other concern was finding a location to operate in. I knew I had the same location as the weekend before, pretty much open. The guy who operates there is kind enough to say I could come there, but I didn't want to step on anyone's toes or overstay my welcome there, so I was kind of looking around for my own place that I could go, and I ended up putting a post on the local Facebook page. And I had a place in mind. It was uh, basically in a store that had gone out of business. So their parking lot was pretty empty all the time. And I just said, hey, does anybody know who owns this location? Or do you know of anywhere else that may be willing to let me set up looking to put my food truck there? And I actually ended up getting, I got a lot of comments, mostly people just saying, you know, you might try this place, you might try that. But I ended up getting actually a direct message from someone. They said, 
hey, I'm actually a, a member of the HOA board out in this community. And we, you know, we have this park here. You're welcome to set up here anytime. We just ask that you fill out this waiver. And I was pretty shocked because around here, the HOAs are known to be very strict. And the thought was always that, oh, you could never set up your trailer in a neighborhood, you know, that'd be against the rules. But here she was inviting me out to the neighborhood. <laughs> and so then I said, well, you know, things were looking good. And that's, I guess, was one of the reasons why I decided to go through with it. So I went ahead and decided just to do one day Saturday, which would give me the whole day to prep and not worry about the stress of trying to get out of work early and things like that. So that's when I went ahead and decided to go for the Saturday. Cool. So location wise, you were originally thinking you made friends with another truck owner and you were going to park next to their truck, which that's what you did for the launch, isn't it? That's correct. Yep. That first weekend, yep, we set up there. And uh, yeah, he's a r- real nice guy. Him and his wife both came over. He wished me luck. His wife ended up buying a taco, loved it. And uh, <laughs> they actually are inviting our family over for a family swim party. So we've officially joined the food trailer family, I guess you could say. <laughs> I love that. So why change locations to the neighborhood? So like I said, I did, as kind as he was, I didn't want to feel like I was stepping on anyone's toes. Uh, okay. And I don't really like to get a spot that, uh, you know, is quote mine that I can tell my customers, you know, this is where I'm going to be. And I felt like that's kind of his spot. You know, he has some agreement with the property owner that I'm not you know, technically on. So just for long term, I wanted something on paper with a uh, business saying that, you know, I'm allowed to be there. Okay, cool. So you've got the neighborhood slot, you're heading down there. Did you use the same commissary setup that you used last time? So that's another part of the story. So yes, I still have the original commissary. However, also in response to that Facebook post, I actually got an email and it was from a daycare owner in the area and it was just totally out of the blue and she said you know i've got this big parking lot uh you're welcome to set up there and i looked at her facebook page she was posting updates about the opening of her daycare center and it looked like it was unfinished but nearing completion and i said oh it looks like you're still working on getting your place built it's coming along you know congratulations and uh, she says yeah you know i'm actually putting in a commercial kitchen in the place as well, you know, for, to <laughs> meet the requirements for the health department. And, you know, I'm actually looking for maybe to make a little extra money on the side in some different ways. And if you think that'd be a good fit for you, uh, you're more than welcome to use the commercial kitchen. <laughs> and I was like, wow, wow. this is just totally out of the blue coming to me after I did my post. So we set up a time that Saturday morning, I went by, I checked out the place. It's still, you know, just bare walls and no flooring, no fixtures, but she kind of gave me a tour, told me what what her plans were, and we discussed some different things. And a long story short, basically, I'm most likely going to be able to use her as a full commissary where I can actually store my food items, where I can do some prep, and possibly, like I said, even operate out of her parking lot and maybe even store my trailer there, which is going to cut off a bunch of headache, a bunch of time lost from transporting the trailer from one location to another and you know trying to prep everything in the trailer and of course I had the issue of not having anywhere to store my food so there's a lot of food waste and wasted time um, having to shop every day for the food so all around it basically was kind of the missing puzzle piece that now makes it kind of a more viable long-term option uh, running the trailer. Well I want to go straight into it sounds like you've decided to take on the year long <laughs> lease. Like that's what it sounds like to me. But before we do that, I just want to know how did Saturday go? What were the numbers like? What were the figures like? Apart from nearly dying and not making it yeah. home at night. Uh that minor detail. How was the rest of it? Did you make money? What happened? Yeah, so the other part of that was trying to get some help, some workers. I had my nephew who, you know, is really excited to work for me. And he had a couple of friends that had helped me out the weekend before. Uh, one of those was still available. And my nephew was available for the early afternoon to help prep. And then he had to go to work later. And so I was really trying to find at least one other person. 
And I actually had several people actually a couple months ago reach out to me on Facebook saying, you know, that their kid was interested in a job. It's, it's kind of funny. I don't I remember my parents, you know, uh, sending out messages for me <laughs> requesting jobs, but I think it's a new world we live in, but they are young, you know, in their defense. So, so yeah, I had a couple of people that had reached out and I'd sent them applications to fill out. And so I reached back out to one of them and said, Hey, I'm going to be up and running this weekend. Would you be interested? So I was able to get another worker. So I was feeling pretty good and uh, spent the whole morning prepping and I got everything good to go. Of course, I was running behind trying to get everything in order on my way to pick up the U-Haul truck to haul the trailer. I realized I'd left my trailer hitch on the last U-Haul that I had rented. Oh, <laughs> no. Yes. And so I was uh, devastated because I thought, you know, this truck could be halfway across the country helping someone move. Who knows? And so I happened to be very close to the rental center that I'd used last week. And I just swung by. I walked in. It was all busy. And I had to wait my turn, you know, and I'm asking, hey, have you seen this trailer hitch? By some miracle, not only had they not sent the truck off somewhere to a new location, but it was actually still sitting there on a busy Saturday afternoon right in their facility. So they, they let me walk out and take it off the truck. And uh, it was a wow. big relief. <laughs> so Whoa. Yeah. That would have derailed the whole, whoa, yes. you were lucky, Keith. Oh, I was, I was very lucky on that one. I mean, worst case, I would have just had to go buy another one, but it would have, you know, cost me more money and another probably hour of my time that I didn't have. So all that to say that I got to the park just in the nick of time. And luckily this time we had done a lot of the prep work. And so still took a little bit of time to start getting food out the window, but just had a couple of people waiting. We got in the groove pretty quickly. Um, oh, one other thing, as I pulled up and opened up the trailer, soon realized that I had forgot to cover up my deep fryers with all the oil in it. And there was oil. So it splashed everywhere. Yes, all over oh. the floor. And the trailer was up at a little bit of an angle, you know, to hook onto the truck. And all the oil had went to the back of the trailer. And there was about an inch of oil piled up in the oh. corner. And so that everyone's asking, oh, how my parents were there, you know, to help out the workers. And they're all kind of standing there, like waiting for me to tell them what to do. And I'm just stressed out with everything. I'm like, just hold on. Just let me take care of this oil. And then we'll go from there. And we're throwing towels down. We're doing everything and slipping all over the place. So, yeah, that was not a good way to start off the night. And uh then to make things uh, more interesting, about an hour and a half after starting to make sales, I had one worker say, hey, I'm really sorry, but I had something come up and I have to go home now. <laughs> oh, wow. So I said, all right, that, you know, that's fine. Whatever you got to do. I couldn't really argue with her. And then about 15 minutes later, the other worker says, hey, you know, I have this health condition. It's kind of flaring up right now. And, you know, I'm enjoying myself and everything, but I really think it's best if I go home too. So there I was left by myself oh. with a few family there that were uh, just kind of hanging out in the seating area. And my dad was taking the orders and I said, you know what, we might just have to throw in the towel. You know, we'd done maybe 10 or 15 orders. And I said, don't take any more orders. I think we're done. And then I, I looked around, there was no one in line. I said, you know what, if it's just a slow trickle, you know, from now till we close, I can probably handle it myself. So let's, let's go ahead and keep it going and just see what happens. And uh, sure enough, we had just some people coming in here and there, maybe three or four orders backed up at a time at the most. And I just pushed through it, uh, got them all out the door. And uh, I bought a lot less food this time because we had a lot of waste the previous weekend. And uh, we nailed it right on the head. Uh, we basically had just enough of the meats to cover all the orders. We had about three people at the end that showed up when I'd already told my dad, all right, we're done. We're running out of food. And they said, well, we'll, we'll wait if it's cool with you and just see if you have anything left over because we, we really want to try the food. And so <laughs> we got lucky. We literally had the exact amount of scoops of meat. For those final three tacos and uh, the one couple was very happy they'd actually driven from the town about 20 25 minutes away and so they were very excited that they got to try it and yeah it was a good uh 
good way for us to gauge how much food we're going to need for the next time because I can look at exactly how many tacos we made, exactly how much food I bought, and that's going to help me with the numbers and with the projections in the future. So in the end, it worked out despite, you know, the oil, losing the employees and, uh, you know, knocking myself out. But <laughs> No wonder you collapsed afterwards. Yeah. I mean, no wonder. <laughs> Sounds like you gave everything to make that happen. So there's a few things. Like, what have you learned from this experience? And how are you going to make sure the issues you faced don't repeat themselves? Because that's one of the things that happens in business is we do something, it goes wrong. We forget that it went wrong and then we do it again. We forget that it went wrong and we do it again. And then eventually we go, I need a process to stop this going wrong. And I only know that because I make the same mistake many times before I get smart enough to know I need a process to stop it. What have you learned? How are you going to stop it from happening again in the future? Yeah, that's a great question. You know, after that first weekend, I actually ran into my parents uh, in the parking lot of the local grocery store. And I think it was just the next day. And they were just asking how I was doing, how it went. And then they had many pieces of advice of, well, have you tried this? Have you <laughs> have you tried that? You know, we noticed this didn't go so well. Could you do that? And I felt a little attacked at first. I'm like, hey, 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 I've, you know, thought about all these things, you know, I'm working on them, I'm making changes. And they're like, yeah, you know, it'd be a lot better if you had everything prepped. I'm like, well, of course, we know that, you know, but I'm struggling my day job and this and that. And they're like, yeah, we, we got your best interest at heart. We just want to make sure you're not biting off, you know, more than you can chew. And so it definitely thought a lot about it. And yeah, they did bring up some good points. And the main thing I learned, I guess, would say, like you said, the processes in place, you know, are very important. For example, the prepping. If I don't prep in advance and I'm trying to cook the meat on the stove while people are coming making orders and it's just impossible to keep up and you feel like you're just chasing your tail. Even on Saturday, it was a big difference. The fact that we had almost everything prepped it went a lot smoother. And like I said, I was able to do a lot of those orders myself, even without the help. So I guess that would be the number one thing is the importance of prep, the importance of having a process in place, and also in the trailer, finding out, okay, how many people do I need? I need one person to work the fryer, one person to top the tacos, one person to take orders, you know, so finding out exactly how things should run in the trailer where should I have everything placed? That's all going to help me get orders out faster. So yeah, I'd say that's probably one of the most important things that I learned there. And let's see, additionally, definitely the importance of having some workers in place. Uh, that was another thing my parents brought up. They're like, yeah, we don't mind helping. And you know, your sister didn't mind helping. But yeah, that she said really being in a hot trailer was not for her. So yeah, if you could try to get some <laughs> actual help next time. And and I'm like, hey, believe me, I'm not just going to like try to grab people last minute every time. I want to have a, you know, an actual workforce that's on the books that, you know, are quote employees, you know, they feel invested in the business as well and paying them a good wage and making an actual schedule and not just constantly trying to grasp at the last second trying to get people in the trailer so yeah i think between the processes and getting the people in place and having the commissary like i said those are kind of the top three things that i think are needed to be successful so keith sounds like you've already in your head taken the year-long lease is that what's happened because you've got until tomorrow to give the answer i'm assuming you haven't rung him yet and said okay i'm in for the year or is that a bad assumption? Uh, well, I have not let him know yet. I figured I need to uh, discuss with my business consultant, Alan. <laughs> <laughs> There's other people as well invested in this, definitely. <laughs> yeah, so I, um, you know, I, that is a great question. Part of me, most of me, I guess, is definitely leaning that way because, as I said, things were kind of falling into place and that kind of usually a sign to me that, um, going in the right direction. That commissary was definitely that missing uh, link that I said. And had it not been for that, getting that new opportunity to store my food, prep my food, and possibly operate my trailer there, I'd be feeling a lot more uneasy. But knowing that I have that option, I uh, definitely feel like it has uh, long-term potential. 
And there's just obviously still that little part of me that's, you know, all the unknowns, worried about all the unknowns. Uh, am I going to be able to find the time to operate it? Am I going to be able to survive this heat? You know, we actually had one food truck I saw they announced in the local food truck page. They're closing down for the summer. You know, they said it's too hot. We'll see you back in the fall. And so wow. I'm, I'm wishing, you know, if this whole thing had been started in like October, it'd be ideal. I'd have a nice six months of weather. So yeah, that's another thing that's kind of got me worried. Like I said, that one worker, the heat was just too much for her. And and with myself uh, not feeling well, it could have been related to the heat also. So yeah, there's a couple little things like that that are kind of, making me a little uneasy. Uh, overall, I'd say I feel optimistic about the product, about the marketing, uh, about the concept, you know, in general, but a few of those little things that make me worried. And just because I know myself that I get a, a bored easily, I like to change my mind, things like that. And this feels a little more, you know, serious than things I've done in the past, because even in Ohio, when I was doing the restaurant space, I was on like a month to month lease. So I had that comfort knowing that I could back out at any time, whereas this is a year-long commitment that I got to do. Well, this is a year-long commitment and a big financial commitment. So we're going to need to talk about the finances in a little bit to work this out, but there's some other stuff. Let's go right back to the top. So in the very first episode, you told me what you wanted out of a business. I have those notes because I'm a geek and I take notes (laughs) always, Keith. That's good because I was going to say I don't remember what I said. (laughs) (laughs) The number one item was ultimate goal is time back with the family. That's the ultimate goal. Uh, This is not going to lead there in the short term, but there is a chance if it operates well, if you can get a crew to operate. But like I think we said in the first episode, that's a long journey to get those processes right. Going through the learning that you're doing right now, that is not an instant journey. took me eight years to pass the revolver test and extract myself from rebel business school. Yeah. So ultimate goal, time back with family. Are you still feeling like this could lead there eventually? Yeah, actually, I, especially having the trailer, I really like the flexibility of it because with the brick and mortar location, you kind of lock yourself into set hours and, you know, you're basically expected to be open the same time every day, every week, whatever it is. Whereas the trailer People are much more forgiving because they just kind of watch your page. And the whole idea of a food truck or trailer, you know, is you're mobile. You might be going to events. You might be at your normal location. And it makes it a little harder for, you know, your customers to be able to know when and where they can find you. But like I said, they're definitely more forgiving if you're not open. It's it's like you just post on your page. Hey, not going to be open this weekend. Have a family thing or, you know, whatever the case may be. So, um, like I said, I've been talking a lot with that other food vendor out in the area, and this is basically his only gig. He works, I think, four days a week, maybe not even that, at his food truck. And basically the rest of the week, you know, he's able to spend time with the family. And I also knew of a, I think they sold snow cones back in Ohio, shaved ice, and they only operated during the festival season, which was during the summer, like, you know, April to October. And they made enough in those six months to spend the other six months down at their, you know, vacation home in Costa Rica. So I think there's definitely examples of people making it work and providing more freedom for themselves. It's uh, like you said, though, it may not be a overnight thing, but I feel like especially having the trailer that that gives me some uh, more options for flexibility. The second item on your list was financial independence. Now, Currently, we're going in the exact opposite direction of that uh, because it's cost us money to operate it so far. But then like that was the game was to do a mini experiment and see, is there a market in Phoenix, Arizona? Are there the people? Is there the business? Will it actually lead to generating a profit? That was the plan. How are you feeling about this one? Well, like you said, it is a money suck at the moment. Definitely has basically drained my reserves down to the bottom of the barrel here. So I think I've got most of the big expenses out of the way at this point. It's just, you know, what do I need for that weekend as far as food and supplies? So I don't think I necessarily need a big chunk of cash necessarily to uh, just do the next event, for example. But ideally, yes, I would like to uh, have some reserves in place so that 
you know, if something goes wrong, obviously I don't want to be teetering on the brink of financial collapse, you know. So, yeah, that's definitely a consideration as well. I think I mentioned before uh, we will be getting some extra payments from the uh, American Rescue Plan starting here next month. And I think that's kind of a uh, good timing with the trailer because it's honestly with our large family, it's almost enough to cover my trailer rent. And so that gives me a little bit of peace of mind knowing that even if everything goes terribly, at least, you know, I'd have enough to uh, pay the trailer rent. And, you know, that's not a situation I would normally be in. So that definitely gives me a little bit more confidence. But yeah, I guess that's where we stand as far as the finances. So we had the five grand rent and the other items that we spent. We had two days trading out of the mini experiment. So we're nowhere near covering the expenses. Exactly. How likely do you think or how far off profitability are you? Do you think next month you could go out and operate three weekends and turn a profit? Do you think that's unrealistic? And really, with military training and family, you should be thinking, I'm only going to do two days a, a month. Like, how much can you actually operate this, Keith? Because you have a full-time job, seven plus one on the way, plus military training. Like, you've got a lot of a lot going on. How much can you realistically do this? How much can you realistically trade? Yeah, that is a great question. And I think I mentioned before that you know, like when I was operating in Ohio, the reason I did month to month, because I knew it wasn't going to be a forever thing, because I was working my full time job, I was doing the restaurant six days a week. And basically, as I said before, you can do just about anything uncomfortable for at least a short amount of time. Mm -hmm. I think my thought would be to try to scale it up as quickly as I can get profitable as quickly as I can. And get to that point where I can at least be in that in-between stage that I mentioned that I discussed with my employer, where maybe they offer me some more flexibility and I'm only working, you know, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday at the day job, and then maybe Thursday, Friday, Saturday at the trailer. Because like you said, under the current circumstances, it would be way too much for more than maybe, you know, a month or two. So that's kind of would be my goal. I would at least want to operate on Fridays and Saturdays and ideally on Thursdays as well. I did some math. Basically, I added up all my expenses, the projected food costs with the percentages of the sales and everything. And basically what it came down to was if I operated for about three to four hours on a Thursday, three to four hours on a Friday, and then basically lunch and dinner on a Saturday, I would only need to average about four orders per hour, basically to cover all my expenses. Anything above that would, you know, would be in my pocket. So I know you can't exactly spread it out over the whole shift because you're going to have busy periods, you're going to have slow periods. But um, I think four orders an hour on average uh, is very doable considering our grand opening event. You know, I did about 30 orders and in, in just the two hours that we were open on this last Saturday, I did 24 orders, about half of those by myself. <laughs> so yeah, I, I definitely think that with the right process in place with getting our name out there, that it's not outside the realm of possibilities to do those three days a week and get those minimum amount of sales to start becoming profitable so it's quite interesting because we're basically aiming to get to just about break even there will be some extra coming in because four orders an hour like what's the average order keith is it the average order like five tacos three tacos and they're fairly big things aren't they like one taco feeds one person exactly yeah and a very hungry person our regular even our regular size is pretty big and yeah, it's funny. People will be like, ah, I'll get two tacos. And I'm like, oh, is this just for you? Yeah. I'm like, well, have you seen how, you know, how big they are? Like, are you sure? And then, yeah, yeah. You know, and then, and then I see them uh, going away with still one of them in their hand or they'll be like, wow, those were a lot bigger than I expected. <laughs> and I'm like, hey, I, I warned you, you know. So yeah, the nice thing about our uh, point of sale system, it will tell you the average order size. So it averages anywhere from about $22 up to around 27 
think I've had it go into the 30s for a short amount of time, but I would say roughly around $25 on the average order. Okay, so you need to take about $100 an hour to break even. Mm -hmm. That's uh, including averaging out the cost of the trailer, you know, my insurance, paying my employees and the food costs, and then a little bit for just random things here and there. So does that include truck rental? Like you had a lot of random costs so far, Keith, and I'm a little bit nervous that none of these costs have been taken into consideration when thinking about the profitability. Because I know, yeah, it's the kind of thing I would do. It's like, oh, that's a one-off cost. I won't (laughs) include that. But those one-off costs happen regularly. Yeah, that's true. I will definitely have to go back and check on the truck rental that I can't remember specifically if I did. But yes, it doesn't hurt to run the numbers again (laughs) and double check. Okay, so financially speaking, do you see a way to get to that change point where you're doing enough orders that you can reduce hours at work to get to doing the three, four days a week on the trailer? Yeah, I think it would take, in my estimation, about two, maybe three months of doing it consistently, uh, having it every weekend, at least one or two days, if not three, is probably what it would take to get to that point. But yeah, based on the experiences here so far, I feel pretty confident that with that kind of time frame, I could get it to the point at least where I could work on some type of negotiation with my employer. So one of the sayings I always like to repeat, Keith, is you can have anything you want in life if, asterisk, you're willing to pay the cost up front and in full. And you've already paid a lot of the cost of setting this thing up. Yeah. Uh, You've had financial costs, health costs, time costs, energy costs. You've had some big costs. And to get to the next level, there's going to be some cost. And cost does not have to be money. The way we've done this with the experiment taking the trailer, it has actually cost us quite a lot of cash, but it Mm -hmm. doesn't have to be money. What do you think the cost is for you to get to the next level? And you're talking in not just cash, but in all those other areas that you mentioned then? Mm -hmm. Yeah, which actually sometimes those are even worse than the cash costs. Yeah, uh, definitely on that one. I think just the exhaustion, the wear and tear on the body, the mental costs, uh, I'd say probably are more difficult than the financial. So yeah, I would say that would be my biggest worry would just be getting through it and especially, like I said, with these hot temperatures that we have to deal with here in Arizona. And so, yeah, that would probably be my biggest concern more than the money would be just surviving the heat and the physical demands that come with it. So, Keith, do you mind if I tell you some fairly raw thoughts that have been going through my head for the last couple of days whilst I've been thinking about you? Yes, hit me with it. Let's hear it. Okay. So the raw thoughts were, I was walking around the neighborhood this morning. The temperature was 92 degrees here in Texas. Ah. It was humid. It was hot. I was sweating just walking through the neighborhood. And I was thinking of you in the trailer (laughs) in Arizona, Uh in the desert, probably running around a trailer like a a headless chicken trying to make all this (laughs) stuff work. Yep, sounds about right. And I was thinking, I'm struggling just walking around the neighborhood to get my steps to feel fit. It feels like this is a very heavy cost. Now, there's obviously ways to make it better. There's obviously ways to look after yourself. There's ways to do things. Like I actually looked at Katie and said, like, is he crazy for doing this? <laughs> you know, I will say, as I was running around in the trailer on uh, Saturday, I think this was even before I started feeling terrible, I was like, man... I'm doing this, you know, for the long term to make a better life for myself and my family. But there have got to be some easier ways to make money. Maybe, maybe I should, <laughs> maybe I should get into real, real estate, you know. But uh, that was one of those ups and downs, you know, that we talked about. And uh, when you're in the moment, definitely, it's it's not like, oh, this is so fun. I'm really enjoying just sweating, you know, five pounds off and running around in this. Uh, yeah, like today, it's actually going to be 114 degrees here. So imagine, you know, what temperature. 114? Yes, <laughs> exactly. 114? 114. 114. Yeah, yes, we're into record breaking territory, I think, this week. So, yeah, I would say my 
honestly, in the back of my mind, I'm thinking of a scenario if I do decide to go through with this, you know, kind of you got to plan for everything and plan for the best. But um, what is it? Plan for the expect worst, the but worst. expect the best, something yeah. like that. <laughs> <Yeah>. so, <laughs> so, yeah, basically, I'm thinking with those extra payments coming through, that would at least cover about my trailer payments. You know, let's say I do it for another two weeks and decide, you know, this is just terrible. Like it's not worth the cost on my health or uh, wear and tear on the body or risk of, you know, heat stroke or whatever. Uh, If I were to just give it a few months until the temperatures drop down and then I hit it hard again in the fall, you know, just kind of buy my time for the next few months, prepare a little more, get some better processes in place, get some stable people hired, get my commissary in place, things like that, you know, would that set me up better for success rather than going in and just hating every moment of it for the next couple months trying to make it work with these uh, kind of temperatures. So I don't know, that's kind of a alternate option, I guess, rather than just going all for it right at the beginning here. Because I think we have to remember, and my wife Katie would be screaming at us right now, it's not binary. Like it's not a, do I take the truck or do I not take the truck? There are many options. We spent an entire episode discussing all of the different options, different ways of doing it. There's different things. We've done an experiment here and the experiment was designed to get some learning about, do we actually want to follow through with this? Do we want to run a truck? Is this the business you want to grow? Are we going to make money? All those questions. Like It's tough when you're trying to make a decision. There is something called the sunk cost fallacy, which I don't know if you know about, Keith. Yeah, I think we discussed that a little bit in the previous episode. Well, you've sunk a bunch more cost into this now. <laughs> yep. Like We are sunk. Uh, yes. We have sunk some money into this. So there's an element of that. So I guess the question I'd be asking now is... Given what we know now, given exactly what we know now, would you have taken the trailer in the first place? That is a great question. And I think the one thing that would make me say maybe not was the fact that it took over months to get the health department license. And instead of having a whole month or a month and a half to do the experiment, like I was hoping, you know, only getting basically two days. So that definitely didn't go as I had anticipated or hoped. So if it weren't for that and I had, you know, the full month to operate, I think I would be saying, yes, definitely. I would have done it from the beginning. Knowing what I know now, I probably would have tried to work something out with him where I didn't start paying, you know, until I had those other things in place. But like I said, it's kind of a chicken and the egg thing. You can't really get the license until you have the trailer But, you know, there's probably still some type of negotiation I could have worked out to make it a little more favorable. There's always a negotiation. There's always a way to make it work out. There's always a different way to do it. I guess my follow-up question is, given you had, imagine you'd run four Saturdays and it had gone well, you'd got the license and you'd done four Saturdays, like the launch, like yesterday, not yesterday, two days ago, given you'd run four Saturdays, and they were like that, would you still take the trailer? Uh, you mean for the for the year-long lease? or you... No, for the start. Oh, okay. Like, okay. If you knew what you were getting into. Yeah, I would say definitely uh, because, you know, the goal of the one-month trial, you know, is to give it a shot in the new area, see the reception of the community, and uh, make some sales and just kind of test it all out, you know, like any – good mini experiment. And uh, I think, you know, even from the two days I've done, I've gotten a little bit of a feel of those things. So yeah, I would say had I done the four, I would, I would have felt pretty happy about the decision to do the, uh, the one month trial. It's not the answer I was expecting, but that's part (laughs) of the joy of this. So the year long lease, I guess, If we went right back up to the top and looked at the other decisions, like you were looking at, do I get a restaurant? Do I find a space somewhere else? Do I trade in different ways? You had all sorts of different things. The decision you're trying to make is, should I take the year-long lease? 
it sounds like you've got yourself comfortable with at the worst comes to the worst, the money from the government covers my trailer costs and I can survive. Like, I'm not a big fan of that thinking because your money is disappearing where you could be investing it for your financial independence in the future. You could be doing other stuff with it, but it's like disappearing to pay for a truck that might sit on the the driveway for the next three to six months and you might operate it twice and then decide this is not for me. Yep, that is a great point. Yeah, uh, definitely looking at it that way, like you said, you know, that's a lot of money that could be put towards other things. And uh, yeah, definitely would not be an ideal scenario to just be throwing the money at it and having it disappear essentially if I wasn't fully utilizing the trailer. Yeah, I would say that basically would be the deciding factor for me would be, am I going to fully utilize this? I think if I do, then it would be a no brainer. I could make it work, make it profitable. Uh, you know, at least after a couple months. So, yeah, I think probably what it comes down to is, am I willing to make the necessary sacrifices? And uh, do I think that going to be viable, you know, over the next few months with all things considered, with the heat, with the location and everything, to actually be making the sales so that it's not just sitting there collecting dust while I'm paying on it? So whenever you're trying to make a decision, there is an opportunity cost to saying yes. Because when you say yes to one thing, you're automatically saying no to -hmm. everything else. And people don't think of it like that quite often. They think of it, I'm just saying yes to that thing and that's okay. But the opportunity cost is by saying yes to the trailer, you say no to taking that money and putting it in an index fund and investing for your future. You're saying no to having time with your family at the weekends. You're saying no to this. You're saying no to that. Like there's a whole bunch of stuff on the other side that you're saying no to in terms of the opportunity cost. And my question for you is, are you aware of what you're saying no to? And are you comfortable saying no to all of that stuff by saying yes to the trailer? So I would say probably honestly the the money – not too worried about obviously money is important but that you know we've gone month to month for so long that it was like anything (laughs) extra feels like amazing so i would say the biggest thing for me is the time with the family and the physical emotional drain so you know i've worked hard my whole life especially with this uh, trailer with the tent with the restaurant in ohio uh you know i'm used to long days long hours doesn't necessarily make it any easier when you have to do it again but like I said I think I can handle that at least on the short term and maybe I if I really want it to be successful I go and have the chat with my employer right away you know instead of two months three months down the road and if I'm not if I don't think it's going to work trying to squeeze all that into one week or that it's going to be you know too stressful whatever maybe I have that conversation now and say, you know, I want to give this a shot, but, you know, I really don't think it's going to be good for how I'm going to perform here at the job. You know, if I do it this way, you know, I'm probably going to be zombie walking around trying to get some work done. So maybe I start by just asking if I can do a half day on, you know, Fridays just to be able to at least, you know, do Fridays, Saturdays, or maybe I just keep doing Saturdays for the first month and then the second month add on the Fridays, you know, something like that. So yeah, I'm definitely willing uh, to make sacrifices, especially, like I said, on the short term for a short amount of time. If it went more than, you know, two, three months where I'm working 40 hours a week, plus doing the trailer on the weekends, plus the army thing, like I said, that would not be sustainable. So yeah, if I could just figure something out for that first couple months, then I think I would definitely be willing to make that sacrifice for the short term. So we do actually have a binary choice to make by tomorrow, which it's either one or a zero. It's either yes, we're taking or it's not. Pretend I'm the truck owner, Keith, and I'm asking you the question. Are you in for the next year? Oh, man, I was hoping I could sleep on it. (laughs) 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 Uh, Yeah, I was talking right now 
I think I still need some quiet time to just really give it some thought, maybe talk about it with my wife, maybe get some other feedback, maybe even talk it through with the trailer owner and just be like, hey, look, this is what I found out over the last couple of weeks of doing this. You know, these are my concerns. And, you know, who knows, maybe he'll throw in some ideas or something to sweeten the deal or to alleviate some of that. But yeah, it's, I would say um, I'm at the 51% at least uh, leaning towards taking the trailer. <laughs> 51%. This is very tight voting here. This is very tight voting. So I actually think that's very smart. I would definitely go and speak to your wife, talk through everything. I think one watch out for you is you tend to be a super positive person and look for everything that could work, which I love. Um, when you're talking to your wife, make sure you give a balanced view mm-hmm. of yeah. what could go wrong and what could go right, because you don't just want to sell her on the idea you want to actually hear her thoughts and feedback. Exactly. And I know sometimes in the past, I've just sold other people on the idea rather than actually (laughs) asking them their advice. You skip all the, all the negative parts, just highlight all the positive and be like, look how great this is going to (laughs) be. And then you get to doing it and you're like, this is not what I thought. Yeah. Yeah. Speaking to the food truck owner, I think is a great idea going, here's the mini experiment. Here's what I've learned and doing it up front before you have to make the decision. Maybe if you could have half an hour of his time today to give him your thoughts and say, look, I just thought I'd speak to you. I still want to sleep on it before I make the decision tomorrow, but I wanted your input before I make the decision. Here's what I found out. I think that's a fantastic idea. Yep. Yeah, and I think getting some perspectives, some thoughts about it, it is a huge decision. I think you need to think about the opportunity cost and what you want to do, and how it works. There's always a way to make anything work. And when you're positive like you and I are, you go, oh, we'll make that work, it'll be fine. But that can be a dangerous attitude and can lead you to all sorts of places. Yep, I agree. Yeah, you know, (laughs) it's like you're walking through some fiery dungeon. It's like, well, I can get through, you know, with the right maneuvers and the right (laughs) equipment. And it's like, yes, but you can just go around, you know, and avoid it altogether. (laughs) That's exactly it. That's exactly it. My positivity says I can make this work, but do you need to? Mm -hmm. Do you need to? Yeah, that's a great point. Which if you look at your ultimate goals, time with the family, financial independence, like those ultimate goals there are many ways to get there and the food truck is one option and we have many many options in life and you're not trapped to any of them you can do anything you want and i know we keep repeating on the show the extraordinary belongs to those that create it i think us humans have this weird thing that we think we have to go through pain to get to the extraordinary goal at the end But it's not always true. Sometimes it can be a pleasurable journey. Sometimes you can find a way to make money, have time with the kids and have fun at the same time. It doesn't always have to be painful. There's always an element of doing stuff you don't like. It definitely doesn't have to lead to heat exhaustion in 114 (laughs) degrees. There's different ways of doing it. So I think I just want to say to you, there are so many ways to get to your ultimate goals. This is one of them. And I know in the past, I've clung to something saying, if I don't make this work, I'm never going to make it. And then it makes me make bad decisions and force through something that maybe wasn't quite right. So I just wanted to say to you, there are many ways to do this, Keith. We just need to relax. And if this isn't the right one, it's okay just to let it go. Yep, that's good to hear. And uh, like I said, always like having someone in my corner that can look at it from the outside. You know, it's easy to, when you're the person in the thick of things to put blinders on. And so, yeah, definitely some things I'm going to consider and looks like we'll have to leave this episode as a cliffhanger to, uh, you know, give you an update on the next one, but we definitely, uh, you give me some good things to think about. And like I said, we're going to discuss at least with my wife and maybe some others with the trailer owner, do some introspection and really decide if this looks like the best option for me right now. Absolutely. And currently I am 
sort of 30% excited for you. Uh, <laughs> probably 50%, I think you're absolutely crazy, Keith. Oh, well, that's... Uh, and 20% bewildered as to what will happen next. Yeah, the crazy part, we all know that, that's for sure. So. <laughs> <laughs> So for all of those listening, I think I just want to say to Keith, thank you for being so open, sharing your thoughts about your decision making, where you are and what you're doing, because it is only through that openness that we can all learn how to make better decisions and to think it through. I really do think it's incredible that you've done that for us. So thank you for being on the podcast. Thank you for sharing so openly and helping us think it through. No problem. Uh, like I said, I enjoy being here and it helps me as well, having someone to uh, bounce ideas off of. And like I said, your audience will either learn from my successes or my failures, one of the two, but either way, they'll <laughs> learn something. So will we, definitely. <laughs> the three things I would love you listening to take away from this are, number one, what's your ultimate goal of your business? What are you really trying to achieve? Where are you really going? Because that should be what we're holding at the forefront of our minds as we go out there. Because if it's not helping you achieve your ultimate goals, why are we doing it? Why are we running a business that doesn't take us towards our ultimate goals? Number two, by saying yes to one thing, you're automatically saying no to everything else. Your time and your energy is finite. If you say yes to a big project, you're saying no to everything else. So think carefully about what you're saying no to when you're doing this, because there are so many ways to get to the end result. You don't have to jump at the first one that comes to you. We can take our time, we can breathe, we can have space, and we can find the one that works for us. And I guess the third thing that I'd really love everyone listening to this to take away is there are so many ways to get to any goal. There is no one path, there is no one correct way when you look at financial independence, everyone will tell you, do this, this is the one way. And it's not true. You can get there via investing. You can get there via entrepreneurship. You can get there through real estate. You can get there through having a software or an engineering job and saving all your money. Uh, you can get there through getting a high paid job. There's so many ways to do it. There's no right or wrong answer to any of this. It's what feels right for you. And I would say to everyone listening to this, if you're trying to make a decision, check inside what is right for me. How do I feel? Does this feel right? And imagine through going through the future. Imagine where this takes you and check inside to see how you feel. Because there are a million different ways to do anything. Is it right for you? Thank you for listening to The Rebel Entrepreneur. Have fun. Make money and do a little good along the way. You can have any life you want to. Choose to build something cool. Choose to take action. Choose to work to make your dreams become reality. Stand out. Be different. Be yourself. Be a rebel entrepreneur.